Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Welcome back to our four-part series called Friends with Benefits. And I must say, this weekend's message was the hardest to put together because there's a real tension in what we're going to talk about today. I personally have a very hard time losing people in my life. I'm one of those people who once I make a friend or a family member, whatever it is, uh, I have like severe abandonment issues. I do not like losing people. I put myself in relationships and friendships that I probably should have ended a long time ago, but because there's this connection or whatever you want to talk about and, 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 and call it, maybe we stay in friendships too long. Today's topic is called unfriending. Unfriending. And we're using this idea of unfriending because of Facebook. Facebook, right? Have you ever had to click the unfriend button or the unfollow button on someone on Facebook because maybe their stuff was too negative or too controversial or too political or too whatever. Raise a hand. Have you ever clicked the unfriend, unfollow? Yep, yep. Don't look around the room. Don't, don't look at the person that you, that you clicked. Hmm. The idea behind today's message is that maybe there are some people in your life that you need to unfriend in order to pursue a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. Or maybe let's not use the word unfriend, because unfriend just seems really strong. Maybe we need to redefine some friendships in our lives. Maybe we need to set some new boundaries in relationships in our lives. And why would we talk about this? Because it's our main idea of this whole series. You show me your friends, I will show you your future. Show me who you're hanging out with, show me who's influencing your life, and I will show you where your life is going, where it's headed. King Solomon said it like this in Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm, and if you're like me, you have had some foolish friends throughout the years, all right? So, so here's the, the idea today. Hanging out with people who are wise, you become wiser. You hang out with a bunch of idiots, and you become a bigger idiot. Yes. In fact, a bigger one, yes. In fact, I bet if you look over the course of your life, chances are pretty good that any time you got in some big trouble, you didn't get in big trouble alone. All right? So... Back in the day, I lived in Scotchtown, and there was Lower Scotchtown, there was Upper Scotchtown. There was just like this great divide between Lower Scotchtown and Upper Scotchtown, and we were always fighting between Lower Scotchtown and Upper Scotchtown. All right, if anybody knows anything about it, right? So Upper Scotchtown is up by the baseball fields. Lower Scotchtown was down by uh, uh, that, the church down there, and there was that divide. And so... <laughs> Oh my gosh, we were such instigators, man, right? So one guy would have beef with another guy, and then we'd all be, oh, oh, and next thing you know, there's like five of us fighting five of them. Yep. Huh? Yep. The biggest trouble was when I was with other people, egging each other on. One idiot telling another idiot to do something bigger and better, and Proverbs 12, 26 speaks directly to this. It says this, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The wise, the righteous, choose their friends carefully, carefully. Now listen, we're going to meet people by chance, but we deepen our friendships by choice. We're going to meet people by chance, but the righteous, this Bible, the word says, deepens them by choice. We choose our friends carefully, but the way of the wicked, it says, 
leads them astray. If you ever hang out with somebody and just get this unsettling, please do not believe that you are the hero that is going to change them. Please don't be the hero that's going to fix them. Ladies, let me talk to you for a minute. Ladies, please do not date the guy because you think you can fix him. You can't fix him. You can't fix him. And here's the, even the bigger thing. Why do we all assume we're all of each other's problem? I'm going to fix them. Man, you can't fix yourself. You can't fix your makeup. You can't put your eyeliner on straight. You, <laughs> I got to stop. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. If you're taking notes, write this down. It is impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. It is impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. I'm going to say it one more time. It is impossible to live the right life when you have the wrong friends. You cannot live right if you don't believe right. You cannot live right if you don't hang around with the right people. All right, listen, I had a very bad cursing problem. Very bad, very bad language. Since I was a kid, man, my dad would hear me like cursing outside and come out, whoop my tail in front of all my friends, and then he walked back inside, I'd cuss him out behind his back. <laughs> but listen, you know if you suffer with that, like you got bad language, and then you're going to work on it, I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going to stop saying bad words. And then you have degrees of bad words. Like, you can say certain ones, and they're not really bad, but then, like, there's other ones that you know are bad, and you work on it. But then you hang out with that friend that ain't righteous. You hang out with that friend that ain't, that, that ain't worrying about that. And, man, they're just cussing, cussing, cussing. By the end of the day, guess what? It's rubbed back off on you. All right? You cussing, too, man. You back in that, and you had been on a cuss diet for a long time. Broke your diet. It's absolutely impossible over the course of your life, listen to what I'm saying, to live a God-honoring life when you do not have God-honoring friends. You cannot live in the darkness and be the only light. Eventually, eventually the darkness is going to dim your light. Hear me. Hear me, man. If you were the strongest Christian in the world, you thought you were the strongest Christian in the world. I'm telling you, by not being around other people who feed your light and feed the glory of God, it will affect you. 1 Corinthians 15, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. No, but I'm a solid Christian. I'm the light to the world. I get it, but the Bible says it. Bad company will dim your light. It will dim your light. you got to get some godly friends. But you know what? This doesn't really apply to me because I'm such a good person. Okay. All right. This is the person who they marry a non-believer. I'm going to change them. Man, you ain't going to change nobody. You ain't going to change nobody. Listen, the only person that can change anybody is God, and that's if the person gives them permission. <laughs> come on, come on. All right. Don't be misled. That's why this is very strongly worded because there's people who are like, yeah, but this doesn't really apply to me. I'm, I'm kind of a good person. They're not going to make me bad. That's why it says, don't be misled. Don't be foolish. Don't be stupid. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl who thinks that the Bible doesn't apply to them. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Show me your friends and I'll show you who you are becoming. Because you cannot live right without the right friends. And then here's the tension. Here's the tension because we're talking about unfriending and knowing that there are times where you're going to have to sever relationships and walk away. But there's this tension that we can't eliminate. We can't get away from. Because although the Bible says bad company corrupts good characters and we're, and we're supposed to be, stay away from people who tempt us, the Bible says that Jesus was a friend of sinners. 
There's a tension. There's a tension. Jesus surrounded himself with kind of some bad people. I like, I like Peter, the disciple Peter, because he was like a fisherman. But I see him more than a fisherman. I see him as like a sailor, right? Like a pirate. <laughs> I think Peter had tattoos. I think Peter had a foul mouth. I'm not saying that's why I liked him. I'm just saying I can relate to the guy. Do you know what I mean? And yet Jesus says, I'm going to choose you. You're a fisherman, but I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And there's this tension. There's this tension. Am I supposed to stay away from people, or am I supposed to reach people? The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Don't be joined together with them, and yet we're also told to be the light of the world, and that our light is to shine in dark places. We're supposed to stay away from those people, and yet we're supposed to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So it raises this question, should we avoid those people that are going to tempt us to run away from God, or should we be the light that reaches out to those people? And can you see why this was a hard sermon to write? Because there's a tension. There's a tension here. When am I no longer an effective light? When is trying to reach someone enough? And at what point do I end this? How long do I stay in this without becoming codependent? How long do I stay in this until it's clinically abusive? Am I the light or am I to run? And the answer to the question is yes to both. And that's the tension that we have to embrace. That at all times, we need to be careful to not let the wrong influences pull us away from God's call in our life. But at the same time, we need to be careful to not let our hearts grow cold to those who God wants us to bring light to. <laughs> it's a tension. So how do we solve this? How do we solve this tension? And I'm just going to be honest. Part of this tension is never going to go away. Part of this tension is never going to go away. Because like, what if the people who hurt you the most, either negative or gossip or don't believe in you, is family. Huh? That's it? We just ditch family? Never talk to them again? Bounce? You could. You could. But that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt your grandkids and, the, and, the, and, and your nieces and nephews and all that. So there's this tension. There's this tension of being in uncomfortable positions and places where maybe it's not the most life-giving, but yet maintaining your light. Maybe this is why Jesus disappeared a lot. He was surrounded by 12 idiots all the time. And he had to be like, yo, deuces, I got to bounce. I need to get away from y'all. I need to go pray. I need to get refueled. I need to get my light recharged because y'all draining me. Maybe. What I believe at the foundation of this teaching is this principle. That if you are a committed follower of Jesus Christ, those who are in your inner circle of friends, those who are in your core, those who influence you the most, hear me, they must be committed followers of Jesus as well. When they're not, when the people who are the closest to you, who have the biggest impact, have the biggest voice, who are giving you the most advice, are not Jesus followers, you are going to be led astray. You are going to go off the path. They are going to dim your light. Why? Because the core, your core friends, is where you're going to get your strength from. 
It's who you're going to call in a time of need. It's who you're going to lean into. They have the most access to you. And when your roots grow deeper and they connect to those others, then you grow deeper and wider and broader, and that needs to be rooted in the things of God. When your friendships and the people that you hang with are rooted in the things of the world, oh, these are my drinking buddies. They're never, they're never going to give you what you're looking for in times of trouble. They're never going to do it. But when your inner circle is made up of the right people, it's life-giving. When your inner circle is not made up of the right people, you're going to hear the wrong voices. You're going to be led into evil. You're going to be tempted to back away from church. You've got to have those core, strong, deep roots with other believers. Can I tell you this? Just from some personal advice. Do not associate with those who are easily angered. Or you will become one of them. I'm going to say it again. Do not associate with someone who is easily angered. They will make, listen, well, they just triggered me. Grow up. No one can trigger you. There's no such thing as someone triggering you. You are emotionally immature. Because words mean nothing but the definition that you put on them. And it cannot trigger you. It simply cannot. You are just waiting for a specific word to be said that gives you permission to be an idiot. That's all you're waiting for. And so everyone in your life walks around on eggshells around you to make sure that they don't say one of your buzzwords. How abusive. How abusive. This is not adult behavior. This is not, because you, you can't hang around people who are easily angered. The Bible, listen, go read the book of Proverbs on a man who's easily angered. The Bible calls him a fool, her a fool. Foolish. Come on. Jesus is the perfect example in, ev in every way. He loved everyone equally, but listen, he did not treat everyone equally. We don't like that. We don't like that. We don't like the fact that he loved everyone equally, but he didn't treat everyone equally. Listen, he had at any time 200 people following him, but then he had 12 disciples, but then when he really needed to get into the nitty-gritty, he had three. They weren't all treated equal. The 200, they didn't get his vulnerability. The three did. The three. And then even then, with those three, he said, you guys can't even stay up and pray with me for an hour? Well, that's good. Well, that's good. He loved everyone equally, but he didn't treat everyone equally. He loved them, but treated them differently. And listen, there are people in your life that you love. We love, we love, we love, we love. We need to be big on love. But there's a boundary as how close you get to be to me. And you know it, you know it when someone who you don't want in your inner circle is trying to get close to you. Oh, you know it. You know it. It's like those hairs standing up on the back of your neck. You're like, I got to get away from this person. They didn't really do anything bad. They didn't really do anything evil. But you just know they're not supposed to be that close to you. They're a leech. They're a gnat. They just drain you, right? Come on. There are times when everybody wanted to be Jesus' disciple. People were sick. People were being healed. They saw miracles. He would draw a line and people would come after him and try to be like him and be one of his disciples. But he couldn't accept everyone into there. He had to draw some lines. He had to pick and choose who got to be that close to him. Hear me. 
He loved everyone equally, but he did not treat them equally. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. You cannot live the right life with the wrong friends. So what kind of friends do we need to unfriend? Let, let's start there. What kind of friends do we need to unfriend? What kind of friendships do we need to redefine? And it could be that there are those that are just incredibly negative, incredibly negative people. They criticize everything. Every time you're around them, you become lesser of who God wants you to be, and you become more negative. Come on, you know it. You know when you hang around someone who the moment you hang around them, bam, it's just about everybody, and this is, uh, this is horrible, especially politics. When's the country going to change? It could be as simple as that. It could be as simple as, hey, you know what? I cannot be around negative people. And you begin to adjust that. It could be that there is someone who's tempting you to do things that's not honoring to God. I'm not, I don't even need to go into that. You can put, again, these are just words. Put your definitions to them. But you're being tempted to do things that is not honoring to God. Maybe that relationship needs to be redefined. It could be that there's someone that's trying to introduce their values to you opposed to what God's values are. Maybe someone's trying to convert you to a different belief system and that's all they want to talk about all the time. There are some friends that we need to unfriend. But there's this tension. There's this tension. What's the other side of this? I want to give you two things today. Two things that we will never let our friends do. Two things that we will never let our friends do. Number one, I will never let my friend distract me from God's plan. I will never let my friend distract me from God's plan. Now, we could go even a whole lot deeper on this whole thing because most of us don't know God's plan. So we wouldn't know if we were being distracted or not. <laughs> That's even a deeper tension. But when you do know God's plan and someone's trying to pull you away, do not let them. And this happened. This happened with a conversation between Jesus and Peter. Jesus is saying, I must go away. I must be with the Father. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to die very soon. And Peter's like, you don't have to do that. You can't leave us. It's not your time. You're stronger than that. You're bigger than that. Just command them. Come on, Jesus, we need you. And Jesus snaps his neck and says to Peter, what? Get behind me. Whoa. Satan. He called him straight the devil. He called him the devil, and it wasn't because Peter grew horns and turned red and was the devil, but he was speaking under the influence of something that was trying to move Jesus off his track. I've watched parents do this to kids who have like this deep heart desire to become something specific in their life. But then the parents are like, nah, that's not going to make you any money. You're going to do what I never got to do because my life is miserable and I'm going to live my life vicariously through you. Come on, somebody. You know we do this to our kids all the time. They're in karate and soccer and dance and all these things, and they hate all of it. But because you never got to do it, they're going to do it. And I'm going to go broke doing it. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're trying to distract me from the plan of God. You're trying to move me to do what you want me to do and not what the Father wants me to do. Matthew 16, 23. Get behind me, Satan. Hey, listen, I'm going to say, maybe, maybe some of your friends need to hear that sentence. 
when they're trying to get you to do something that you know you're not supposed to be doing. Go somewhere you know. Come on, man. Come on, man. It's going to be a great time. Come on, man. Just one night. Come on, man. Just one more drink. Come on, man. Bro, get behind me. Get behind me. Now, you probably have never gotten to the point with one of your friends where you seriously call them Satan. But what Jesus is saying is, you're being a stumbling block to me. You're being a stumbling block. You're feeding something in me that needs to be starved. Maybe you've been that kind of friend that eggs your friends on. Maybe you have friends that are egging you on. There needs to be a spot that you draw the line. Hey, listen, man, we're not going to do this to each other. We're not going to be these kind of friends that enable and pursue the wrong things. Get behind me. Get behind me. So that friendship may need to be redefined. I need to redefine a friendship that is putting me in the wrong direction. And it could be that the person's a pretty decent friend, and they're well-intentioned, and they don't think that they're doing anything wrong. Nah, man, what you need to do with your life is this. And then there's this tension, right? Are they speaking wisdom? Do they see something that you don't see? Or are they speaking foolish? Well, we got to go back to what does God say? What does God want in your life? What does God want in your life? Hey, listen, if, if, if you have a friend that's always telling you what you need to do, but they don't ever pray, it's a problem. It's a problem. Hey, man, before you give me advice, how about we pray about this? And if you think that's weird, like if you think talking to God is weird, hey, uh, you're kind of signing up for an eternity of that. We're kind of signing up to go to heaven one day and talk to God all the time. So, like, let's get a jump start on it now. And it don't have to be nothing weird. I took someone to the dentist the other day. They are going to get a procedure done in their mouth. And right before they got out of the car, just put my hand on the shoulder. Lord, I thank you for protection, for rest, ease of emotions. Guide the doctor, Jesus' name. So ain't nothing weird. We didn't stand out in the parking lot and call fire down from heaven. But, but this person knows that I got their back, not just relationally, but spiritually. Come on. If there's something that you know you need to do, don't let them talk you out of it. It's the Judas spirit. So don't be a Judas. What do you mean Judas spirit? Mary breaks a box of very expensive oil and begins to anoint the feet of Jesus, and Judas comes along and says, why would you do this? This is worth 300 denarii, whatever the price was. We could have sold this and given the money to the poor. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. He was stealing money from the, the money box, so he was going to steal it anyway. But, but, but the Judas spirit, why are you doing this? You, sh you can just save your money. You can do more of this. You can do more of that. Don't let friends distract you from God's plan. Never, 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 never. Number two, if you're taking notes, I will not let my friends continually tempt me to do wrong. So I'm not going to let them distract me from God's plan, and I'm not going to let my friends tempt me to do wrong. If someone's tempting you to do wrong, guess what? They're not your friend. They're not your friend. Because they will, they will exalt your well-being over their own personal desire if they love you. If they love you. Now, what does that mean? I'm not going to make you do something that specifically feeds me if you're not comfortable doing it. I'm not going to tempt you to do something that is not right. That's not love. That's not love. It, I'll tell you what it is. It's lust. It's addiction. I'll tell you straight out. Come on, I'm talking maybe some young people right now. I don't know that maybe you've ever even been in love. I think maybe you've been in addiction to somebody. You were addicted to them. 
addicted to them being, listen, if you have to control somebody and their decisions and what they do and know where they are, you're not in love with them. You're addicted to them. Just like alcohol or drugs where you got to have your multiple stashes and be in control of it and know where everything. I'm trying to help somebody today. Sometimes we need to unfriend those who are trying to tempt us. Don't drag me down with you. A perfect example of this is when Joseph in the Old Testament, he was betrayed by his brothers. They sold him into slavery He ends up at Potiphar's house, and Joseph was seemingly a good-looking young man, hard worker. In In Genesis 39, verse 12, it says, Potiphar's wife caught Joseph by his cloak and said, hey, baby, come sleep with me. But he was a man of integrity. He could have. He could have. Come on, can we be for real? Like, single guy, tempted by a hot wife. Hey, no one will know. Tempted, temptation. She said, come to bed with me. But the Bible says he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. That's not what she said. That's not what she said. She didn't like being rejected. So she said, he came in to take me, and I fought him off, and I have his cloak. See, Joseph would not stand around and let himself be tempted to do something that he knew wasn't right. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. You ever said you're going to be on a diet? Huh? You ever told anybody you're going to be on a diet? And then they cook something? Or they bake a cake? Or they make a pot? Or it's Memorial Day weekend? And you're on a diet? And they make their signature meal? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know you're on a diet, but you have to try my 5,000 calorie cake. No, no, you gotta try. It's a secret family recipe. You gotta, yeah, but I'm on a diet. Like, I'm trying to lose it. No, but you gotta eat it. You gotta, you're gonna hurt my feelings. (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. That's so manipulative. You're gonna hurt my feelings if you don't break your vow. Gotta get rid of him. That's not a friend. That's not a friend. Listen, that person's more of a friend to their cheesecake (laughs) than they are to you. Think about that. No, 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 no. Just keep practicing breaking your word. Keep practicing breaking your word, and I'm going to be the person to tempt you to do it over and over and over again. Hey, listen, let me tell you this. Failure is just as addictive as success. People get addicted to failure because it's an excuse to keep failing. I've tried every diet there is. No, you didn't. You downloaded the ebook. <laughs> you didn't try. You didn't give it 60 days where you didn't. Yeah, but the food was bland. I had to add my seasoning. You didn't do it. Come on, some, I'm just saying, hanging around the people that are tempting you to break your word. If you hang, dudes, guys, single guys, if you're hanging around the guys that are always like, yo, we got to go find some hot chicks, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You're going to get yourself in trouble, married guys. Don't sit around with the coworkers and talk smack about your wives. You're going to be a very, very unhappy married man, soon to be single, tempting you to do wrong. Come on. Can I tell you this? Sin is fun for a little while. No, it's not. Sin's not fun. Hey, listen. If you sit there and tell me right now sin isn't fun, either 
you ain't never did it right. <laughs> or you're in sin now because you're a liar. That's the addictive side of sin. It's fun for a little while. And then it grabs. It has a cost. It always has a cost. And that's when it grabs you. That's when it hits you. It's when it grabs a hold of you. Okay? That's why the Bible says the way of the wicked leads you astray. Here's what I want you to know today. When you got the right friends, when you put the right people in your life, it's the decision that we have to make inside of ourselves. I will never, ever stop loving people with the unconditional love of Christ. Listen, 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 listen. They don't all have to be your friend. We don't all have to agree. I don't have to agree with you politically. I don't have to agree with you socioeconomically. I don't have to agree with you how we invest our money. I don't have to agree with you whether zero-turn tractors are better than regular tractors. Like, we don't have to agree. We don't have to agree. We don't have to have the same color skin, come from the same cultural background. I don't care what your preferences are or what your pronouns are. I don't. I don't care. I'm never, ever, ever going to sit back in bigotry and say, I'm not going to call them by that. Okay, you win, and you're miserable with your life. You're so right that you're miserable. You're so sure about your truth that you're miserable, and you're angry, and that person is living their best life, and you're angry. Love others. Love others. Jesus said, above all, love Love, love, love. Listen, does that mean that I agree? No, I don't agree. I don't agree. I'm not standing there and saying that everything that people do is right. It's not a license to go do and be. No, I love you. I love you, and I can love you with disagreeing with you. I can love you with having a different viewpoint than you. I can love you without having the same political views as you. I can love you for you for what makes you uniquely brilliant but when I try to make you like me it makes it hard to love it makes it hard to love I don't want you to miss the power of this I will not I mean, this just needs to be the thing in your heart I will not stop loving you people the way Christ loves me. That doesn't mean I stand there and let you slap me in the face multiple times. Hey, listen, Jesus said turn the other cheek. I'm turning the cheek and getting out of there. I ain't getting hit twice. I'm not sitting there and letting you degrade me, put me down. I'm out, and I love you. And I love you. And some things, sometimes the greatest thing that you can do, loving someone is distancing yourself. I love you from a distance. Because that's where we're both the healthiest. Come on. When you think about it, Jesus didn't unfriend sinners. He befriended sinners. He didn't run from a challenge, he ran to the challenge. If he unfriended anybody, and I know here's the biggest tension, if he unfriended anybody, it was church people. <laughs> it was people who had access to the truth, but didn't extend the truth to others. People who had the grace of God but wouldn't extend grace to others. People who had access to eternal life, but never opened the door for anybody else. Those are the ones that Jesus said, ill.
get behind me. Get away from me. So the opposite of religion, the opposite of judgment was Jesus. It's time the church stops judging people that aren't Christians for acting like they're not Christians. Did you get that? Come on, I gotta say it again. It's time the church stops judging people who are not Christians for acting like they're not Christians. They don't have the way, the truth, and the light. You do. But you're, listen, you're never going to convert someone until you love them. See, religious church says you have to behave, then you can belong. Jesus said you belong. And by belonging, you'll believe. And by believing, you'll behave. He opened the door. He said, come in. Yet, yet he had boundaries to those who were affecting him the most. I hope I didn't confuse you today. I'm leaving you with the same tension. This is not a pretty packaged sermon. I really tried to bring the front to the end and do what I did and put a bow on it. This one doesn't have it. Because there's a tension. We are the light of the world. But I can't only hang in darkness. Iron sharpens iron. But I'm to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Look at the example of Jesus. Know when it's time to get away with your core and recharge. Maybe it's starting a small group. Maybe it's starting a Bible study. Maybe it's starting a prayer group or coming out once a month to fan prayer. Maybe it's joining a serving team. Maybe you just need a good night out with the fellas and come out to June 10th uh, men's night out. Whatever it is, how are you going to recharge from those who drain you? And how are you going to be the light to those who need it? I'm leaving you with an unfinished sermon today because you need to write the rest of the story in your life. You need to write the ending. You need to write as the days, weeks, months, years go on. What are you going to do with friends? Are you going to be a good friend? Are you going to be the one who's always complaining that you don't have any friends? Are you going to go out of your way to make friends? Or are you going to isolate yourself? The choice is yours. But to be the right friend, I'm just going to throw this out. You need to be a friend of God. You need to be a friend of God. The Bible says, with his friends, he shares the secrets of his covenant. Maybe if you've never heard from God, maybe you feel like your prayers are, maybe you've never really, truly committed to him. There's only one thing greater than a friend of God, and it's a son of God, child of God. And to do that, it's a simple prayer. It's confessing him as Lord and inviting him into your life. And I would like to offer that to you today. If you're watching online or you're in the room and you've not had that opportunity to become a family member with God, would you pray this prayer with me today? And because we love you, we all pray it out loud together because this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.